Welcome to the Lazy Money Machine, where we show you the easy, no-nonsense way to financial and time freedom. Here are your hosts, Graham Brown and Eric Tenhaver. Hey, what's up, folks? Graham here. I'm solo, freestyle today. My partner, Eric, is gone AWOL. He'll be back. Don't worry, it's just me. So, only half the Lazy Money team today. Um, but I promise you, it'll be twice as educational and twice as exciting. So, most of you are probably watching this on the archive because I know that most people in this group are on different time zones, which is fine. So, um, forgive me that I'm just going to rattle off probably um, maybe a monologue a little bit because there may be no interaction <laughs> because people are still middle of the night wherever they are in the world. Um Cool. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to do a short Lazy Money live and just to keep the thing going. I said on um, the Facebook group on Tuesday that I would do this on my own and I'll share a little bit about my story, my experience, um, in particular what I've learned in investment and also a bit about my own investment strategy. I don't necessarily talk about this publicly um, so this is the benefit of doing it in a private group because not everybody gets it, you see. And that's one of the things I want to talk about as well, that not everybody gets it. Um, you know, what tends to be the case is, you know, not always the people around you are the ones who really understand a, what investment is, but also whether or not it's a good thing. So, you know, when you effectively, you're talking like a capitalist in front of people who, tend to think about this in the pejorative, negative terms. So, you know, you learn, as I have done, to be a little bit guarded about what you talk about when it comes to investment. And you're talking about money as well. So you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily like talking about money to people I don't know um, because you just don't know what they're thinking. And that could also mean family as well. So one thing I've learned is not necessarily all the family that you have support you when it comes to talking about money, there can be a lot of jealousy and misunderstanding as well. So when it comes to talking about money, I tend to talk about money with the people who also want to talk about money and get it. So that's why I'm doing it here. And I want to share with you a little bit about my personal story and investment, what I've learned, what I can share really in the next 15, 20 minutes. And well, just to kick off a little bit about Lazy Money Machine as well. So uh, our goal with the group was to create a group of like-minded investors who could have this kind of environment where we could share information, support each other. And our first milestone with building Lazy Money was to really just test to see if there was demand for it and test to see if it worked. And... The fact that Eric and I both have other projects ongoing, we're not full time on lazy money and never will be. And that's the whole point because it's lazy. It's in the name. So, um, you know, our, our point was to build something that we could run part time because just like yourselves, you know, you're not going to be a hundred percent into something all the time, every day of the week. And that's fine because if you're uh, a, a good investor, then you will have other projects on the go anyway. So that's what we wanted to build. So our build up has been organic and measured and controlled. And I think we've reached that stage where we've got, I think 10, 11 people into the group who've paid. And you know, that proves the point. Our goal was to get 10. So I think we've just made it in the last couple of weeks, which is great. Our next stage really is now to say, how can we grow this group? Because the value of the group really depends on interactions and to keep the interactions growing, we need to grow the group and get new people in people who can bring in new ideas, new content, new discussions, you know, and naturally some people are going to drop off the group because they are busy at that particular time and they come back later on. That's natural. That's fine. So we're reaching stage two with lazy money at the moment. So we've completed the MVP stage, minimum viable product stage to use the startup uh, vernacular. And we're now going to stage two, which is now let's scale this group and that will benefit everybody. So what you'll see over the coming weeks is Eric and myself 
uh, focusing on getting, uh, you know, getting the group out there, trying different advertising strategies, uh, different marketing strategies to, to generate, uh, new, new, uh, customers, new people, new members for the group. Um, so don't be surprised if you see new people join over the coming weeks. That's the plan. You know, we want to grow this thing so we can have a hundred people in this group, hundred active people all helping each other. So, you know, if you want, somebody who can help you out with property in Spain or property in New Zealand, there's somebody there and somebody you can talk to. And that's the point. Everybody benefits, the network effect. So just to update you, that's where we are. We're at that stage two now, just in case you're wondering what's going on. So it's seven o'clock here in Tokyo, as you can see from the timer down there. And, uh, that's not Tokyo, by the way, but it looks quite nice. That's my daily desktop. Um, it's a fantastic little app, by the way. I'll, if I can remember the name of the app, I'll share it with you. Every day, a full HD photograph greets you as you open up Chrome. It's fantastic. I love it, especially if you love travel like me. So um, let's talk about what I'm going to talk about, which was the uh, the lessons that I've learned being involved in investment. And I started, you know, I mean, I was a saver when I was a kid. I was the kind of guy, kid, I should say, that, you know, used to have a little handbook and write down all my pocket money and save it. You know, I used to love those little kids' bank accounts that they used to give away with, like, you know, the, the piggy bank and stuff like that. You know, and the, I don't know, you get toys back. I'm talking like, you know, late 70s, early 80s, a long time ago, different millennium. Um, but I always was a saver. And maybe it comes from my, my family because my, my dad was a farmer. So, you know, I always think of farming as like an investment mindset. Obviously, you know, farmers aren't necessarily rich people, but their mindset is similar to investment, which is, you know, a farmer has to plant the seed and then, you know, water that seed for weeks and weeks and nothing happens to that crop. And all the while it's growing underground, just having faith that that's going to grow. And then, you know, suddenly it just pushes through and bursts through. But it's a constant process. You can't give up even when you can't see something. And you have to give up something in the beginning to get something back. You have to plant to reap what you sow, so to speak. And that's the same as investment. And I always was ingrained with that, even though nobody in my family was in any way professional or from a middle class background. You know, they were... Uh, my farmer family was from my dad's side and then my mum's side were shipbuilders. And, you know, again, they were like the farmers, Scottish. So, you know, hardcore savers. They would, you know, save money. Um, Glaswegian shipbuilders. So uh, my grandfather was a real, um, not tight fisted. That's a bit, a little bit mean to say, but, you know, he really very careful with his money because they grew up in an era where they didn't have any money. So, you know, that two generations back in my family were uh, very, very poor, both sides, and they had no money, and therefore they weren't professional. They didn't go down the professional route. The only way they saw themselves getting by was to save, hold on to money, be very, very spend, spendthrift. Um, so that's kind of rubbed off on me a little bit. I was always interested in money at a young age and how you could save money and use money. And, um, when I came back from Japan in the nineties, my first job as a career outside of, you know, working in Asia for a couple of years was to work in the city and get qualified as a financial advisor. And this was in the, the mid nineties. And this was the kind of job where you'd uh, pick up a phone and make a hundred phone calls and sell life assurance over the phone. Uh, but that's what I was doing. And you learn two really, really valuable skills in that process, which, you know, as anybody who's starting their own business needs to have these skills. Firstly, understand money. You know, there's so many things I learned as a financial advisor that they never taught you at school. And you never learn anywhere in your career. You can go through life without knowing these key concepts about money. And I'll, I'll share with you what those are today that I learned. And secondly, sales and you know, people ask me, I mean, sometimes people graduate and they ask me, especially when I work with startups, you know, what's the best thing I can do? What, what skills should I learn? What programming language should I learn? All these kind of things. 
you know, I want to be a successful entrepreneur. I want to do like what you did. How do I do that? Where should I start? And they expect me to say, oh yeah, well, actually you need to learn Python or C++. But, you know, my answer to that is always, you know, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, if you want to be a successful investor as well, because usually you have to be an entrepreneur before you are an investor, not always, but usually, then the number one skill that you should have is sales. And, you know, if you can't sell, then learn how to sell. Get out of your comfort zone. You know, learn hardcore selling. And you'll probably not like it, but the experience is probably the most valuable business experience ever. And if you can't sell, you'll never be successful. And people think, oh, selling is like, you know, selling double glazed windows over the phone. Um, but it's not, you know, there's many, many different ways that you can sell. So, you know, business advice, generally, everybody in this group has a business. Um, you know, if you want to be successful in the business, learn how to sell. And if you can't sell over the phone cold calling, that's fine. Not many people can, but there's a way that you can sell. So find out what it is. Everybody has a way that they sell. Everybody, you know, has a sort of a, a format for selling. And I think of it, it's like, you know, it's like music. You may be, uh, if you're musically gifted or talented, you know, just because you can't play a guitar doesn't mean you're not a musician. You could play piano. You could play the drums. You could sing, whatever. You could dance. But it doesn't mean that just because you can't do one thing, it doesn't mean you can do all of it. So it's the same with selling. It's because you can't do cold calling doesn't mean that you can't sell. So learn the type of selling. Learn the instrument that you are good at selling. So some people are good at selling by writing. As an example, you could be a writer. Some people are good at selling by doing these kind of video presentations. That's another way of selling, right? Um, some people are good at selling, doing face-to-face -face meetings. Some people are good doing events. Find what it is. You know, try them all and find what kind of selling works for you. And that would be my advice to anybody in business is like find the format for selling. And if you don't know what it is, then you need to discover it because until you discover it, it's very hard for you to grow your business because, you know, every business succeeds and fails through a lack of sales. I challenge you to find a business that hasn't, you know, has failed for some other reason, right? Think about that again. Every business succeeds or fails through sales. So every business fails through a lack of sales. You know, either the sales were less than their overheads or the overheads were greater than their sales. It's the same thing, right? It's the same. So learn how to sell. That's my first piece of advice. And that's what I learned from working in the city as a financial advisor. And I had to qualify. And to qualify as a financial advisor, you have to do tests. You have to study. You get, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You get, uh, Mm, background checked so they background check you to make sure that you're not some kind of financial um fraudster or terrorist you know pretty deep background checks not just like you know the kind of background check you do when you, you sign up for a property it's pretty thorough they go through everything and you know you can't sort of give them a cv where there's a gap of two months between leaving one job and starting another and you know, what do you do in those two months they want to know so they're really really thorough so I had to go through all of that and I had to do the test and I had to study and I became a financial advisor. And there's one part of learning about products within the financial world, which is what I did. I learned about products. I learned about investments, endowments, life assurance. I learned about pensions, about stocks. I learned about, you know, the basics of property investment. I learned about currencies, hedges, gilts, bonds everything so i learned about all of that and nobody ever teaches you any of that and it was just a fascinating insight and here's the interesting thing what i learned about that was not how each one of these financial products work but how people thought about them and this was the most revealing to me and this is what i want to share with you now and i'll, I'll jump into the whiteboard um there we go would be let me just delete some of this what I want to do is I want to, um, what I'm going to do is just sort of draw a few diagrams to help illustrate this so you can understand. 
I would do this on a, a normal whiteboard if possible. But um, hey, this is the 21st century. Let's see how it goes. All right. So what I want to do is talk about uh, investment strategies and sort of the average person's investment strategy. Let me do that again. That's not the shape that I wanted. All right, whatever. So the average person's investment strategy. And the average person doesn't know shit about investment. Let, let's remember that. And this is what I learned that very few people know um, a lot. And a lot of people know very little. And a, a little is a dangerous amount to know, right? And, and what they do, average people, and I used to sit across people in my uh, office. And I had, a, I had an office on the 24th floor in Centrepoint in Tottenham Court Road in London. Um, I could see over the whole of London. So it's a pretty plush office. And people would come there and sit there and tell me about their everything. I would learn everything about their finances. They'd have to, you know, it's not like just going to a doctor and saying, I've got a headache. It's like going to a doctor saying you've got a headache and then the doctor giving you a full body scan, looking at everything that you ate, you know, measuring you every indicator of your body, but doing that financially, right? That's what we did. And people would come and they'd say, okay, let, you know, obviously I want I want money. I want to do this, that, and the other with my life. And generally speaking, what people would do is they would build this kind of investment strategy, which is they would, um, you know, they would have their, their house, which I'll put there. And then they would, you know, maybe, maybe some people would get into real estate uh, and then, the rest people would get into stocks and shares and that's that's sort of very typical um there's not a lot of diversions from that that's was very typical and i saw that in 95 percent of the people that came to see me uh some people were pretty savvy and they they had a different strategy but that was generic you know be questionable whether or not people had a real estate strategy so often it was just all of this would be stocks and it's just a little bit a little bit of saving maybe uh, but the problem with this this strategy was that, you know, it, it's very top heavy, that I used to say, that, you know, if you can imagine the winds of circumstance would come along, the winds of circumstance would come along and, you know, this is current events, this is everything, and blow this over because, you know, it's a very top heavy, top, you know, if you were an architect, you would understand that this structure is not very centered, it's not very grounded. Uh you know, so that is a bad structure. And that was how people structured most of their financial strategies. And I learned that. And I, I didn't, you know, I used to think that a doctor, as an example, was a wealthy guy. But, you know, I sat in front of doctors who were earning 100, 125, pounds to so $200,000 a year. And they would be $200,000 in debt. And I think, hang on a second, how? Wait. Your 200k a year income, your 200k in debt. How on earth did you ever get into that situation? And there are a number of factors, and this is what I learned that you know there, there was really no correlation between income and wealth. So you know uh, that's the biggest takeaway that I learned from working in the city. Absolutely no correlation, and that sort of made me think: is that hang on a second? You know, I went to school and went to university and surrounded by all these people, and I read the papers and I looked at the news you know, the magazines and they all told me income wealth. It was the correlate, you know, you know, you got a good job, you became wealthy, but there was none. And actually I sat with a taxi driver who was earning like 30,000 pounds, so about $45,000 a year. And he had like a quarter of a million in um, equity in about four or five properties at the time. And that was, you know, at the time, this is like 1996, that was a lot. And if he held on to those properties, he, you know, he, those would be worth a lot of, he would have a lot of equity in those properties now. So this guy was earning a quarter of what the, uh, the doctor was earning, but somehow he was half a million up. And that somehow was all about financial education. And it comes back to this image here is that you know this is what the doctor would do and it's sort of like the common response to building a wealth strategy is they would not understand the difference between and this is really important between capital 
This is all money, right? And risk capital. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. It's important to understand the difference. Capital and risk capital. Now, capital is money that you can invest, right? That's what it is. Look it up in the dictionary. That's what it is. Risk capital is slightly different. But the doctor didn't understand, like 95% of people, the difference between capital and risk capital. And that's... Uh, I mean, if you don't understand now, look, stick around because I'm going to explain what it is because it's important because otherwise you end up like the doctor, you know, quarter of a million in debt. Um, and I realize now, actually, I, I've sort of, I need to move this guy across. There you go. I can do that. Awesome. We have the technology. So there we go. That's the uh, very traditional way of doing things where, you know, what I want to talk about is how I've tried to build my investment strategy. And in the same way to the taxi driver, it has little bearing on how much income goes into it. It's more about the, the shape of the, the pyramid, so to speak. And this is what I learned as a financial advisor from other people's mistakes, effectively. And there's like three levels to my investment strategy. And... Um, Hopefully you can see this. I haven't cut this off. The, the, there's a bottom 10%. There's a chunk, which is the middle 70%. And then there's the 20% at the top. Let's talk about what these are. So the bottom 10% is your base. This is what I'd call the hedge. Now, hedge uh, effectively means to protect against... Um, the winds of circumstance, so to speak. So it's, it's a very firm base. And I'll talk about what I hedge in in a minute. And then 70% in real estate. Okay. And then the 20% is my risk capital. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Risk capital. Now, the financially uneducated would just see all of this is the same. It's all capital. It's all money. I just invest it, right? That's if they even have money to invest, which most people don't. Let me just move this across. There you go. Because I understand that was sitting under my face there. Not a nice image. Not a nice thought. So um, let's talk about these. I mean, this is what I learned. What the difference is between these three elements. So a hedge, real estate, risk capital. And this is the structure that I built for, and I still try and adhere to this. And I think it's kind of necessary to have all these elements. So people come along and they say, oh, what about Bitcoin? What about Bitcoin? That's not a Bitcoin. I've done that wrong. Let me just start again. That's a Bitcoin. A Bitcoin. That's a B, isn't it? That's like a dollar. Oh, I've messed that up. Anyway, so that's kind of like a Bitcoin. What about Bitcoin? Are you in Bitcoin? Are you in oil? Are you in oil? The, the, oh, what about startups? Startups. Are you investing in startups? These are all risk capital. Now, risk capital effectively is money that you can put in looking for outsized returns, looking for uh, investments which you will get very large returns from, um, you know, rather than safe uh, investments. You know, this is the stuff that you cannot build your future on. You know, if you make money out of this, you're either in the right place at the right time, lucky, or, you know, you know something that nobody else does. So this is what I put in risk capital. So if you were to lose all of your 20%, not a problem. You'll still be around. That's the problem. There's a lot of Bitcoin millionaires out there at the moment who um, have probably lost millions in the last few weeks because the price has dropped. And... I've been challenged a number of times why you stick money into property when you can stick money into Bitcoin. Well, I do both, but I have a different strategy. If I lose my money on Bitcoin, it ain't going to sink the ship. If I lose my money on property, it's going to sink the ship because property is the ship, right? However, you know, look at where we are with Bitcoin. It went up to what, fifteen, sixteen thousand $16,000, went down to ten. I don't know what it is today, but it's below ten, and then back up. And can you imagine what kind of stress that would be if your financial future was based on that price? You'd be, you know, and that price was going up with 50% one week, down 50% the next week. You know, 
money aside, that ain't good for your health. So put that in risk capital and ring fence that stuff. And what I mean by that is ring fence it such that, you know, you can afford to lose it all. And, you know, Eric and myself have both had this experience investing in startups as well. You could put in $10,000, $50,000 into a startup and you could lose it all. However, that's okay if you go in with that attitude that that is risk capital seeking outsized returns. You can afford to bet that money. And risk capital is a bet. Bitcoin is a bet. Oil is a bet. So always go into those assets with that attitude. Nothing else. You can't build a future on Bitcoin, oil, any of the, the you know the things that I've said, startups, for example. Okay, so let's just ring fence that off at the moment. That's that's risk capital. Real estate's the 70%, which will come to last. And the hedge, well, for me, the hedge is gold, currencies, and cash. And maybe I have probably more than 10% once you factor in working cash as well. So the hedge, um, I invest in gold. I didn't say... It's difficult. I mean, invest, I don't think you invest in gold. You buy gold and you hold gold. I don't really see it as an investment because uh, the gold price doesn't really change. And here's the thing. I, I don't know if it's true, but it's often quoted that if you planted um, a gold coin in Roman times, a gold Roman coin in the earth, um, and that gold coin back then could have bought you a chicken. You know, if you dug that gold coin up today, that gold coin can still buy you one chicken. So it's kind of a bizarre tale, but the takeaway from that is is important that, okay, gold goes up, it's like 1,200 bucks, then it's 1,400 bucks, then it's 900, but that's over a period of like five, 10 years. Uh, you know, it ain't changed rapidly, but over the very long term, gold has retained value. and over thousands of years it's kept its value it hasn't you know gone up by um double treble 10 times whatever what you'd expect with risk capital or real estate but that's the point that's why it's a hedge it's it you know if the world falls apart today then we'd still better use gold to buy stuff right no if the dollar collapses if the yen collapses if the chinese renminbi collapses Whatever it is that you hold your wealth in, if the euro collapses, then you still have gold. And, you know, all it takes is some madman to press the button. And that could be that madman in North Korea or that madman in America. It's, you know, we're not that far away. So there's no harm in having a hedge. And I certainly think it's a good idea. And it's certainly worth keeping a hedge of cash and especially currency because um you know it's important to move currencies around i mean currencies have a nat i'm not a i'm not a forex trader but it's worth bearing in mind that currencies have natural couplings and natural boundaries long-term boundaries long-term you know trading ranges so i mean if we take for example like the yen and the pound the british pound you know, that's traded between 110 and 250 over the last 20 years. And it hasn't gone out of those range. You know, it's unlikely that the yen would ever drop to 300 uh, yen to the pound or the pound would drop to 50 yen to the pound. It's unlikely to go out of those ranges. So the, the point is, is like when one currency reaches the bottom of that trading range, the chances are within the next couple of years, it's going to turn around and come back. You know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to get slaughtered. You know, do not do Forex trading unless you really know what you're doing. And there's a lot of courses out there promising that you can make money out of Forex trading and just be very, very careful because they will slaughter you. And that coupling, by the way, British pound, Japanese yen, that's called the widow maker, that coupling. And there's, there's a reason for that, as you can see. So I've kept currencies, I keep a basket of currencies in Hong Kong and I can change those currencies when, you know, I believe that one of the couplings is either maxed or reached a, a minimum, a very long term minimum. 
I don't do it on a day to day basis because it's not healthy. And it's good to have a steak, you know, as well. I mean, if you, for example, like when we moved to Japan, um, I was lucky that the pound to the, the yen was 190 at the time, which was like a, you know, a, a medium term high. So what I did and I thought, well, that's not going to go up a lot more. It might go up to 200 or 210, but it ain't going to go up a lot more in the next few years. And it's certainly under pressure to go down. So what I did was I changed like a year's worth of money from pounds into yen and kept it in a yen account. So I'm living here in Japan spending yen. My rent is in yen. So effectively I had geared the whole year and said, right, that's my year paid for. And yes, it went from 190 to 197 later that week. But the point is, it's a hedge is saying, okay, that's fine. I've taken a, a call on this and my call is I would rather now lock that in because I know I've got a year's worth of money because the stress of, you know, uh, having to watch the Forex exchange rate on a daily basis and wondering whether or not you're going to have enough money to pay for the year um, is too much for anybody, right? So what I suggest is, is, you know, wherever you are in the world, and I know a lot of people are traveling, a lot of people are, moving around long term, maybe living in different countries. Think about that. Think about trying to hedge your, your, um, wealth by not putting it all in one currency. Cause that can be a dangerous game because effectively, again, you're putting your future in the hands of people you have no control over. So when the, um, British population in their infinite stupidity decided to brexit then um you know the pound dropped like i I can't remember the exact figures but let's say it was at 150 dollars and it dropped to like over a period of weeks dropped about 135 so that was a 10 percent. you could have had 10 percent of your wealth wiped out overnight because of a bunch of people shouting we want our country back you have no control over that so hedge where possible. And the most important hedge is cash, which is just money that you keep in your bank account as spare. You should always, always keep cash, not because you need it to pay for the shopping, but you need cash because markets change. And um, the, the famous saying, the Warren Buffett saying is that <clears throat> markets remain uh, irrational longer than you can remain uh, liquid, which basically means that, you know, the market can, you think, okay, right, I'm going to go into a market and buy some stocks and this is going to go up, but then the stock goes down and you, you, you double down on the dip and it keeps going down and down and down. And you, you lock in all your money into this market and it doesn't turn around. You think it's got to turn around. It's got to turn around, but markets can be irrational for a lot longer than you think. That's why you've always got to keep cash. And it's not just in stocks, but also in real estate as well. You have to maintain cash. And you try this. If you ever invest in stocks and put all your money, just spend all your money on those stocks, that's the easiest way to get wiped out. If you look at any professional investor, they always keep maybe 15, 20% of their portfolio as cash. Because what then happens is, you know, tomorrow there could be an oil shock. There could be, you know, Donald Trump could have a heart attack. And whether that's good news or bad news, the market will drop because the market does not like uncertainty. Because if Donald Trump has a heart attack tomorrow, you have no control of that. Um, We don't know who is going to replace him. It could be Hillary. It could be Donald Trump Jr. It could be Ivanka Trump. So the point is, is that, these circumstances we have no control it goes back to this let's go back um go back to this drawing here it's this here it's the winds of circumstance we have no control over it so if the market drops you could have 20 percent of your value wiped out in the same way somebody could increase interest rates it could wipe you out um so always having cash is important because then you can buy into the dip because there's always bargains to be had you know in 2007 when the market dipped, I had cash 
Now, 2008, when the market really went down, 2007, the warning signs, 2008, you know, Ford Motor Company, Ford Motor Company was available at $1 a share, 1.1. I was in at $1.10 a share. And you think Ford Motor Company ain't going to go out of business. So it's just completely wiped out by speculation. So I went in at $1.10 because I had cash. and didn't need a lot of cash. And, you know, within time, that was up to $10 because it floated back to its natural level. As with all crashes, look at the, you know, historical precedent. You know, you look at all markets, and this is the same for property as well. You know, all markets will go up and down. But every time a market goes down, chances are it recovers, you know. I think if you look at the 2008 crash, it recovered within about 16 months, right? So they always recover. That's natural. That's a pattern that repeats itself. So if you don't have cash when this happens, you miss out on the bargains, right? And this is what I learned as an investor. Here's the interesting thing about this stage is that when markets crash, something very interesting happens. And this is appropriate to property as it is to stock investing is when a market crash happens if you have a property or you own stocks nothing changes you still own the same amount of property and you still own own the same amount of stocks and you'll probably still get the same amount of income so what's the problem the problem is is that losses are only made when people sell what's happening is Let me just undo some of this artwork. What happens is is people start selling around here. They're panicking. They start selling. They start selling. They start selling. And this is where the money is made. Money is not lost. You see these title. You see, you know, like the news. It will say a trillion dollars is wiped off the uh, value of shares. A trillion dollars is lost on the market today. A trillion dollars wasn't lost. A trillion dollars changed hands. That's all that happened. Because for every person that sold, somebody bought, somebody bought, somebody bought. So this is the understanding. And I think this is what taught me being an investor and being a financial advisor is that you understand the psychology of investment is very important. And that is that you have to take the emotion out of it. That 90% of people act on emotion. And that's why they get slaughtered. As the saying goes, bulls make money, bears make money, and pigs get slaughtered. It's because they're greedy, because they don't understand the market, because they treat everything as an emotion. And it's the same with property as well, that they go into property as an emotional investment. You cannot go into property as an emotional investment. And there's a good reason for that, because if you go back to this here maybe i can pick a different color there we go lovely we go back to this thing here 70 percent 70 percent of your property real estate real estate is probably the most uninteresting business in the world sorry to say but it is just uninteresting so that's why you know you can't go into it emotionally you have to go in it from the context of being an investment being logical about this stuff right um, and why, the reason why I want to say that is because I, I think, you know, you have to look at real estate for what it is, and that is a an investment business. Let me just bring this up. We're in red now. Let me just move this across a little bit here. I think, you know, this is what I did when I came out of the investment world and started my own business. I had a strategy, and it was this. And people didn't really understand it at the time. And I only kind of really understood it in hindsight. And I want to share with it this with you now. And that is one, have a lifestyle business. Um, which is something that you enjoy. Like this. I mean, I really enjoy this. I really do. And I enjoy working with Eric and I enjoy working with you guys and building your questions. Um, so how, build a lifestyle business and Build a lifestyle business that creates cash. And the goal is to create cash flow. And the reason why you want to create cash flow is you want to take that cash flow and invest it in 
an investment business. An investment business, right? So a lifestyle business and an investment business. And I think, I'm not saying this is the only way you can do it, but this, this absolutely worked for me. And this is what I put there to the lazy money group is that my recommended strategy for investment success is these two components. A lifestyle business is something you enjoy. It makes you happy. You wake up and you really want to do this. You go, hurrah. I'm really digging this. This is brilliant. I'm working with fantastic people. And an investment business just goes to work in the background. And the problem is, is people like get these confused and they do these two things together. And I want to explain why I feel that doesn't work is because a life sales business is something you really enjoy. It's an emotional commitment. And the goal of a lifestyle in business, sorry, the goal of a lifestyle business, the, the the goal, what you get for winning at the game of lifestyle business is the ability to keep playing. That's the goal is to keep playing, you know, because if you were successful and you made a lot of money, what would you then do? You'd then do what you were doing in the lifestyle business. So if you're a musician in any form, or, you know, you taught music or you're involved in the music industry, music because you loved music, or you're a sports person, or you were a designer doing animation, and you just love doing this. That was a lifestyle business. Now, look at it from that perspective. This is your emotional capital. This is what you wake up, and this is what you want to do until your dying days. Absolutely. Lifestyle business all the way. That's what it's about. But you ain't going to make a lot of money out of this. Like Nobody's going to buy a music school or a design company or, um, you know, a single triathlete. And nobody can buy that, right? Because all the value is held in the assets which walk out the door every night, right? So you'll never make money out of that lifestyle business beyond what you can create in the short term. But then you can, you know, rather than thinking, oh, how can I build this and sell this? Or how can I build this and make a lot of money in the future? Think about it. How can I build this and make money now? and extract money out of this lifestyle business now, you know, even if you were extracting out of that business a thousand a month, it's still good enough to um, build a significant life investment business. You then take that excess cash and you put it into an investment business, which is inevitably some really badly drawn houses. <laughs> Those are the, they look like mushrooms. They're awful. These are the worst. The worst houses. Whatever you do, do not buy these houses. They're awful. They look like, you know, even a two-year-old kid could make a better job of designing these houses. So apologies. Um, so these are my rubbish house. Oh, but I was like, you can't see these, can you? I'm really sorry you can't see my work of art. There they are. I'm glad you can't see those because they're dreadful. There you go. I'll put them there just so you can see if you're left out. So take the money out of a lifestyle business and put it into an investment business. The investment business, that is all about future wealth. It's all about asset creation, passive income, make money whilst you sleep. Because you can, whilst you're focusing on the lifestyle business, having fun, the investment business is in the background doing the work. You can't mix these together, right? These can't be the same thing. Separate these and view these without emotion. Strip these away. But build your lifestyle business, focus on that, forget about the investment business. Forget about asset appreciation, forget about the valuations. Just let that do its job and make money whilst you sleep. Because, you know, that can never be an emotional thing for you. It's very difficult to enjoy that. It's very difficult to feel that you're making a difference. Because what's going to happen is, is that up to a point, you know, you could really enjoy real estate, but you might start thinking, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing on this planet? I want to make a difference. I want to do something, you know, if this was my last day in the world, do I want to be going in and talking to a plumber about pulling out central heating in a house? No. So if that's the case, if you don't feel that, then that shouldn't be your lifestyle business. That should be separate. So this is my twofold strategy 
twofold strategy for creating wealth, lifestyle business, investment business, and keep them separate and treat them separately. And don't make the mistake that I did. A mistake that I made um, early on was I only ever focused on the lifestyle business as an investment business. I thought it was the same thing. I thought I was going to um, build a web design company, which I really loved doing, and then sell it for millions. You know, I could have made a lot of money doing web design, taking the money out and put it into an investment business and made millions. Um, but I didn't. I thought it was, I had to build this, I had to sell this thing because that's what everybody else was doing. But then, you know, as we understand what other people do as per Mr. Doctor is not necessarily what you should be doing, right? So hopefully that was useful. I know I've been on, I've been on this now for 45 minutes. I said I was going to do like 15 minutes and there's so many things that I wanted to talk about, but I just kind of got into that whole sort of investment strategy and um, try to break that down. Hopefully that was useful for you. You've been listening to the Lazy Money Machine. Find out more at lazymoneymachine.com.